This video is sponsored by Raycon. It's a company co-founded by Ray J that makes these great earbuds that I've been using. You can go to buyraycon.com slash company man to get 15% off your order. The link is in the description. Microsoft has been growing aggressively already for decades. They have been one of the biggest companies out there, but over the last few years, they have really accelerated things. I mean, look at this. In 2021, they had over $168 billion in sales, which has more than doubled over the past decade, and it makes them the 15th largest company in the United States. Honestly, how much time goes by before they're in the news again, talking about their latest insanely large acquisition? It's seemingly one after another. On the stock market, they were the third company company to ever be valued above one trillion dollars and the second company to surpass two trillion. Yeah, based on that figure, we can call them a multi-trillion dollar company. It's not often you get to say that. And sure, they've had a few missteps at times, but overall, we cannot deny that this has been one of the greatest all-time success stories. So for today, I want to talk about the history of this company while trying to identify some of the main reasons behind that success. In January of 1975, the cover of popular Electronics featured the Altair 8800, made by the MITS Computer Company, which is now considered to be the first commercially successful microcomputer. Two of the people that saw that magazine were computer enthusiasts Paul Allen and Bill Gates. They had been friends since they were teenagers, and three years earlier had actually established a small company called Trafo Data. It was named after this equipment they designed to analyze data about traffic. They sold it to some local traffic departments, but that was as far as it went. So when they saw the this magazine, it made them realize that computers would soon be dropping to a much more reasonable price, and at that point, it would be profitable to sell software for them. Their plan was to contact the maker of that computer, tell them that they were already writing a programming language for it that would make it easier to create programs and therefore make the computer more attractive to potential users, and they said that they'd be able to present that language within a few weeks. Now, I don't believe that they had actually started on it when they made that claim, but either way, it was finished in time and distributed under the name Altair Basic, which later evolved into Microsoft Basic, and that was the start of Microsoft. They chose that name as a combination of the words microcomputer and software. They made $16,000 in that first year, but by the end of the 1970s, they were making over a million dollars a year by writing and licensing different computer languages. So, on to my list of why they're successful. It was hard to find the exact words here, but the ones that I chose are ruthless and relentless. What I'm trying to convey is they have an overall reputation of fighting aggressively, and many would argue even dirty, against the competitors. And let me give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. In 1980, IBM was looking for someone to provide an operating system for their new PC. The market leader at the time was called CPM. It was made by this company, Digital Research. In this instance, the two sides there were unable to come to a deal. So Microsoft stepped in and said they'd be able to do it, and that was kind of their big break. So Microsoft goes to this guy named Tim Patterson from a smaller CPM. Seattle company who had developed his own operating system called 86DOS that, as I understand it, was actually heavily based on CPM. Microsoft buys that system, alters it, and rebrands it as MS-DOS, and it was then included with the IBM PC. So then, Digital Research, the creator of CPM, takes issue with that, and to avoid a lawsuit, IBM said that they would make both of the systems available in their PC. It would just be up to the buyer to choose which one. However, CPM ended up costing more, and at that point, it was just unable to compete with MS-DOS. So that right there is a sketchy situation that led to Microsoft's product beating a major competitor. Another example would be a few years later involving a copyright issue with Apple. In 1985, Microsoft introduced Windows 1.0 and it really wasn't all that popular. The overall design was influenced by the operating system Apple used in the Macintosh and parts of the GUI or GUI or whatever, the look of it, were actually licensed to them by Apple. When Microsoft introduced Windows 2.0 in 1987, one of the big differences was the titular windows were now able to overlap with each other, along with other changes. The differences made it so much more successful. It was introduced in November, and they sold a million copies of it by the end of the year. Well, in 1988, Apple filed a lawsuit against them, claiming that the visual displays were too similar to their own. The ultimate ruling was in favor of Microsoft, basically saying that most of the similarities were covered under that initial licensing agreement for Windows 1.0. But, 
again, we have a sketchy situation where Windows was greatly helped against a competitor. I'm gonna keep giving these examples. In 1994, Microsoft was willing to pay $1.5 billion for the maker of the financial software Quicken. That controlled 70% of the market at the time, with over 6 million users. Microsoft's existing competing software was called Money, and that controlled something like 22% of the market. This potentially says a couple of things about them. For one, if you do the math, it means that they were trying to control almost the entire market, raising concerns of a monopoly, which is a common theme for them. And two, it shows that they were trying to control that market, not by further developing and promoting their existing product, but rather by simply taking control of the competitor, which is another common theme. In the end, the Department of Justice felt that it would create a monopoly. They tried to prevent the acquisition, and then Microsoft just gave up at that point, so the deal never actually happened. My final example here has to do with Internet Explorer. It's the web browser that in the second half of the 1990s practically beat out Netscape and took control of that market by bundling it together with Windows, essentially giving it away for free. It's a complicated issue, but the concern became that they were utilizing their power to monopolize all of the internet browsers, and even other software as well. In the year 2000, the court actually ruled that Microsoft had to break up into two companies that would separate their operating system business from their software business. However, there was an appeal that ruled that they didn't have to break up, but they did agree to give other developers the power to make software for Windows. So yet again, an aggressive technique against a competitor raised concerns of a monopoly. All right, my next reason behind their success is being financially cautious. And I'll admit, this may not apply as much today, but financial stability was a big concern for Bill Gates and the following CEO, Steve Ballmer, from 2000 to 2014. From very early on, Bill Gates wanted the company to maintain abnormally large amounts of cash. His rule was that they would have enough money in savings to where they'd be able to operate for a full year without receiving any revenue. On top of that, he was very hesitant to hire new employees that he felt weren't 100% necessary, and everyone that was on payroll was known to have low salaries that were complemented by what became valuable stock options. They didn't have any long-term debt until the early 2000s, just an overall safe approach that made them financially stable. Then, when Steve Ballmer was in charge in 2004, the company had this big multi-million dollar cost-cutting effort that famously involved ending their towel service for employees. You know, they would provide towels for people that had been exercising or playing a sport or whatever. It was a little extreme. Overall, the efforts were thought to have a negative impact on employee morale, people were leaving for Google and other companies, so they reinstated that towel service and other benefits a couple years later. All I want to convey here is that historically, Microsoft has been more financially stable than most of their competitors and most companies in general. My final reason behind their success is diversity, because it's practically impossible to have over $100 billion in sales without selling a variety of stuff. Here, I'm gonna start making a new list of the types of businesses in which Microsoft has been heavily involved. I've already talked about programming languages, that's how the company started, and then operating systems, both DOS and Windows were the things that got them to that next level, but what I have haven't talked about is their productivity and business segment, which of course includes Microsoft Office. I mean, we have all used this, right? In 1983, they introduced Microsoft Word, but like many of their products, it didn't catch on too well in the beginning. But in 1986, they introduced a simplified version, 3.0, that quickly became their best-selling product. In 1985, they introduced Excel based on an earlier program that didn't do too well. Then in 1987, they actually purchased Forethought, the company that made PowerPoint, for 12 million dollars. Once they had collected all of these popular selling programs, they started packaging them together in what became their new best-selling product. Also, along the lines of professional products are a couple of major acquisitions. In 2011, they bought Skype for over eight billion dollars. I have an entire video about their evolution if you want to hear more about that. And then, in 2016, they bought LinkedIn for 26 billion dollars. And believe it or not, all of that combined, Office, Skype, LinkedIn, and some other things, currently makes up their smallest segment, accounting for 32% of their sales, or $54 billion. Another type of business that has historically been big for them was cable television. You might not expect this one as much, but they were involved in it in multiple ways. In 1996, they got together with NBC to start the cable network MSNBC. However, they did sell their portion of the channel in 2005. The following year, they spent $1 billion to buy 11% of Comcast. It was a deal that said Comcast would buy half a million set-top boxes from Microsoft, but their share of it was sold in 2009. 
1999. Also in 1997, Microsoft bought Web TV for $425 million. Their main product was a box that allowed people to get on the internet using their existing TV. They later rebranded it as MSN TV and shut it down altogether in 2013. As you can tell, this isn't really a part of their business anymore, so I won't spend too much time on it, but starting in the late 90s, cable TV was an important part of Microsoft. Next up is a fun one, video games. In 2001, they introduced the Xbox, and that was the start of something big. Aside from the system itself and the 360 and the One and everything that followed, they had become a major developer and publisher of the games themselves. We're getting back to the acquisitions here. I suppose the first notable one was Bungie, the maker of the Halo games. They actually bought them in 2000 in anticipation of having Halo Combat Evolved ready as a launch title for the original Xbox. Though they did split in 2007 and were later bought by the competitor Sony. Some of the others worth mentioning is in 2014, they spent $2.5 billion to buy the company that makes Minecraft. In 2021, they bought Bethesda, the maker of Fallout and Doom for $7.5 billion and holy cow. In 2022, it was announced that they bought Activision Blizzard for over $68 billion. Those numbers don't even sound real anymore. Obviously, their biggest acquisition to date, giving them major power over the video game industry. Another type of business worth mentioning would be devices, though maybe not their most successful. They acquired Nokia's phone business in 2013 that pretty much just lost them billions of dollars. Again, I have a video that talks about it in more detail, not to mention the Zune, the subject of yet another previous video. They also sell their line of Surface Electronics introduced in 2012, though they have shied away from devices in general. Now, this overall segment that I've been talking about, they call more personal computing. It includes the devices, the video games, Windows, and search and news advertising like Bing. All of that combines for their second largest segment, which is also right around 32% of their revenue. The remaining 36% of their revenue comes from their biggest segment, which is called Intelligent Cloud, mainly cloud services and things along those lines. I'm gonna go ahead and put that as the final one on my list and just say that it includes Azure, SQL Server, Windows Server, Visual Studio, and GitHub, which they bought for $7.5 billion in 2018. Let me know in the comments, how do you feel about Microsoft? There's just so much to talk about, right? For that reason, I realize that my lists are not complete. Those are just the reasons that I perceive to be the biggest behind their success and the types of businesses that I found to be the most important or interesting. Let me know if you think there's something that should be added or taken away from the lists and any other thoughts you have about Microsoft, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Today's sponsor is Raycon and let me tell you, these everyday earbuds have been getting a fair amount of views. Specifically, I've been listening to the It's Always Sunny podcast. I love hearing those guys talk about one of my favorite shows and I've been keeping up with it too because I always try to put on these earbuds when I'm doing something around the house or just anything in motion because they have yet to fall out. They have these optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit. I mean, I could literally just shake my head back and forth and they will not move. It's crazy. They have a built-in mic, 32 hours of battery life that offers 8 hours of continuous playtime. They come in 5 stylish colors. I have the blue ones, by the way. They look very sharp and they sound great. It's quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. I recommend them. They have over 30,000 five-star reviews and you can go to buyraycon.com slash companyman to get 15% off your order. The link is in the description. Thank you for watching.